In this video, we're going to talk just a little bit more about Git and GitHub and how the process can work when you're collaborating with people and a few other kind of tools and approaches you can use with that, with that system. Um, so I've mentioned this a little bit already, but one of the one of the joys of GitHub is that it lets you work with other people on, on code. So there are two main ways that you might do this. The first one we'll do a lot in this class. And the second one is one that I want you to know for once you're out of the class and, and kind of like um, working on your own projects and a little bit more out in the community. So the first type is collaborating. In this case, several different people are collaborators on the same repository. They all have access to the same remote GitHub repository. And then they're all, they all have local versions and they're able to push and pull their own commits from that. So this lets you all work on a project and all kind of have copies of the project. You can think of it a little bit like if you all have access to like a Dropbox folder and you're all working on a project there, but it's got this added component, first of all, that it interfaces really nicely with our studio and lets you do the connection directly from there. And then second, that it can gracefully handle the collaboration pieces. It, it, it can track um, people making changes over time, you can go back and see the changes that were made, and then you can go back to old versions, and it allows people, if they want to, to do a new branch to try something new, and then you can bring things back together once you decide that you like different things that are working. So that's kind of one process. The other is forking. So if you have something up on GitHub that you're developing and somebody else that you, maybe somebody that you don't know has a suggestion for a change to make to it, they can fork it change the code in their fork and do commit messages to show what changes they made. And then they can recommend that you bring that back into your main one by, by submitting a pull request. So that ends up being a really nice way for people to collaborate, even if they don't know each other, on different open source projects that are, that are going on that are posted on GitHub. And in all of this, I've been talking a lot about GitHub. There are some alternatives that do something very similar. And one very popular one is GitLab. And I've used, I've used both in my own research and tend to kind of like go between the two. But everything we're going to talk about works in really similar ways across those different platforms. All right, so one thing that I want to talk about that is very helpful as you start to work with a team is the idea of issues. So each GitHub repository will have um, a tab that's for issues. And this kind of works like a discussion forum where you can post an issue that needs to be resolved, like maybe a to-do kind of task or a bug in the code that needs to get fixed. And then there can be a whole conversation across the team on that. And once it's resolved, it can be closed. So let me show an example of that. If we go and look at the example of the repository that I made with the practice R, you can see it's got the tab right here for issues. So if you click on that right now, we don't have any issues, but if you wanna make one, you can do it by clicking on new issues. And I could say something like um, show um, start of raw World Cup data set. And so I can put a whole comment there too. This issue will be kind of the title that I put right here, but we can put in a whole discussion of what's going on there. So we can say right now we create a table showing some output, but let's also add a spot where we show the original data. All right, once I submit this, we'll have this as a new issue and it'll get a number. So this is issue number one. And I can add more comments to this, or other people can add comments as well. So there can be a whole discussion here. You can end up with lots of issues. If you go back to the issue page now, you'll see that we have issue number one, who opened it, and some information about how long it's been open. Um, and then once you have this list you know, you can work towards that list. So you can have the to-dos that you need to do, and then you can go through and you can resolve those as you go. So once you've fixed an issue, you can close it, and you can either close it here, or you can actually close it with a commit message, a special type of commit message, and I'll show that in, in just a second. So this can be a really good spot for you to have the ongoing conversation about what needs to happen and who might do it. You can even inside these issues assign people in the group like you can assign yourself if this is an issue that you can take on and make sure you resolve but you just wanted to let everybody know that you realize it's there and you need to do it you can assign yourself but you can also go through and assign other people 
that are in the team. And so that will allow you to do that. You can create labels too. Like maybe there's some things that you need to do that are for creating a flex dashboard. And then there are other ones for creating a map that you really want to have in your report. So you can put labels and have different labels on issues if you want to. All right, so if we go into our studio, let's look at an example of how we could close an issue from the actual um, commit message. So we can go in and we've got this R Markdown document. This is just an example one where I had an example equation and then it's working with that World Cup data set. And right now we've got this output where we give the, the table that comes out of it with cable. But for this issue, we're saying that we wanna actually show the first few lines of the original data set. So let's try adding in here head of World Cup. And then in the output, what should happen with that is that should include a printout of the first few lines there. So this code change has resolved that issue. So if we save this here, we'll see in our commit window that we now have something that's been saved since the last commit. And in our commit message for that file, Instead of doing a short message, we can actually link it to an issue. So we can say close number one, and that stands for the issue number one. We can commit it. That will save, save the change to our own computer, and we can go then into the history, and we can see that that change was made there. And then we can push to get it up to the, the version of the repository, the origin that is up on GitHub. So if we go now, you can see that that has automatically closed it here with that commit. And you can see it's even tied and we can click now on this and that takes us to the commit that closed it and that resolved that issue. So in the issue tab, It'll immediately show any issues that are open, any things you still need to resolve, but you can always access the ones that have been closed too just by clicking on the ones that are closed and that'll give the list of all of the issues that have been resolved. So this can be really, really helpful when you're working across a team and you have things that need to happen across the team. Uh, this is a good way to keep track of those and for people to be able to make it clear when they have resolved something that needed to get done. So this is just reviewing some of what I was just, just saying, but, but especially this idea that to link it to a commit in the commit message, you can say close and then the number and put the issue number. Um, and each of the issues in a repository will get distinct sequential numbers. And then when you commit it, that will get linked in on GitHub where that commit gets linked to closing that issue. So other people can click and see the exact code changes that happen to change it. We won't be doing this much in this class, but in that kind of forking process, or even if you do branches, you can do what are called pull requests. So instead of pushing your changes directly, you can request that somebody else pulls them in. Um, so these can be really helpful um, if you're working with other people, especially people you don't know, because then they don't have to kind of trust everything. They can take a look at what somebody's suggesting before they decide whether or not to bring it in. To, to, to what they're doing. But some people will also use pull requests within their own repository. So they might do a branch, which is beyond what we're getting into in this class, but it's pretty easy to find information about how to make a branch and then merge it back in on GitHub. But they'll make a branch and then they'll do suggested changes in the branch and then put in a pull request. Um, and this is something that I've done working with collaborators on papers where we've actually done that as a way to suggest the changes to the text and then the, the main author, the first author, has the choice for each of those change, changes, each of those commits in the pull request, whether or not to pull them in and to make that change. So that can be a really convenient way when you're working with a big team to kind of suggest changes without putting them in directly. All right, if you are doing a pull request, you would fork somebody else's repository, you make the changes in that copy that you've made, which doesn't affect their original if it's your copy, your fork of it. And then once you do all those changes, you save them, you commit them, then you can submit a pull request back to the original repository. And then the owner at that point can decide whether or not they want to bring that into the main branch. All right, another thing that will definitely come up um, as we do some of this collaboration is you can get what are called merge conflicts. So if you make a change, if you're working with somebody else and you both make changes in different parts of the files, 
then GitHub does a really nice job of being able to accept all of those and give you a final version where they're all worked in. But sometimes you might be working on the same part of the file at the same time, and that's when these merge conflicts come in. So I've got an example. Say I'm working with someone named Rachel, and we're both working on the same local version of a repository that we also have a remote version that we both have access to. If there's a line and uh, we both make a change to it, so here I've given the example of um, I change it to empty cars and use square bracketing to pick out the, the first row, and then maybe Rachel does the same line but does pad to do the same thing. So we've made the same change to the same line. And if, if she pushes her change up to the remote before I do, then when I try to push my change, I'll get the message that, that there's a problem. Um, so in that case, we'll get what are called merge conflicts and they show up in kind of a special way. So let me show an example of doing that. And I'll actually come in and again, I'm gonna make a change directly by editing inside GitHub. Again, this is something that I do very, very, very rarely because I think it's much better to do it on your local version in our studio where you can actually check the code and make sure it runs before you push it. But just for the purpose of being able to show this, um, I will make the change here. So let's go in this example, our markdown. And let's say that here I make a change and I change this to pull out the first five rows. So let's see, limit output of World Cup to first five rows. All right, so I've made the change here and I can commit it. And now let's see, I wanna make a change in the same spot on my own version. So again, this is making the change to the remote copy of the repository. If I make the change in our studio, I'm making it to my local copy. And then we're trying to keep those both in sync, but sometimes we'll need to like push from one to the other to get them in sync. So if I come here and maybe here, I do it for the first 10 lines instead. So save that. I now have this showing up because I've made a change and I can come here and here my commit's gonna be change to show first 10 lines of World Cup. All right, so I've made that commit now. Now there are two things to point out. First of all, because there have been any changes, any changes at all, regardless of where they happen, to the remote version, if I try to push my changes to that remote version, it's gonna give me an error message that I need to make sure I pull the latest version because we're out of sync. Something's been changed there that I don't have a copy of locally. So if I try to push, I'll get that error message. And so this is pretty much saying it's rejected it because there were changes that were made there that I didn't have locally yet. So it's forcing me to bring those in and make sure that those get worked in before I push my own. So if you get that message, just, just close, make sure that you've committed anything here and then pull, and this is giving you the latest update. Now in this case, we made the change on the remote and the change that happened locally happened at the exact same place. So we get this message when we tried to pull that there was a conflict, there was a merge conflict. And so it won't automatically merge it in. We need to actually fix these conflicts and then we can finish the merge. All right, so when that happens, you can go to the file where there was the merge conflict and you actually get this like really funky kind of combination of characters. So it'll take any conflicts there were and it'll wrap them in this combination. It will start with a lot of less than signs and then head. And it does this kind of weird combination because this is something that's unlikely to show up in any of your real text. So it's actually really easy to do like control F and find it really quickly. You just look for a lot of less than signs. So this is saying that there, this is the start of a conflict and this is saying that this is the end of it. So these two pieces kind of like bracket each of the, the merge conflicts you have. And you could have more than one of those in a file if there were several places that you and a colleague both made changes. Inside this, it will give one of the versions. So this is what I made the change to in my own local ver version of this. And then it's got this series of equal signs. And then it's got what the change was for the version that I pulled in. 
So this is what I need to fix. I need to look at everything here and change so there's just one version of it. So let's say that I like the change that I made better here. I can keep this. To keep this, I would just delete this line. And then I can delete this line. And I can delete that line and that line. So this has resolved that, that merge conflict. It's taken all the different pieces there and resolved it to just one version. So now I can save. And commit and now you'll see that I'm able to push my version up onto the remote now it will let me do that now that I pulled in the latest changes from the remote and fixed any conflicts there were between the two and we can go and look at github and you'll see now that if we look at this version, it has used the version that I picked out of that merge conflict out of the two. All right, so this is just a reminder of what I just showed in our studio in GitHub. Um, but you can get these in a few situations. You can pull in commits that happened from, from a GitHub repository, but also if you're working on your own and somebody does a pull request, that can be another case where there are these conflicts, especially if the person forked and worked on it and you were working on, a, on it at the same time, there can be cases where, where there were changes that were made and changes that you made at the same time in the same place that need to be resolved before you can merge the two together. So as a reminder, this is what these look like. They're set off by that head and then by the tail and often they'll be a, a kind of like long string after that. And then in the middle, it's got the information for the two different versions. And sometimes these could be multiple lines. Like here, I'm showing a very simple example where it's just one line of code, but sometimes it might be a few. To fix these, you decide what you want as your final version for any of the code showing up in there and then replace this whole piece of text with the final version that you want. So in this example, I would take all of this, and if I want this head empty cars one, if that's the final version I want, I'll take this whole block of text and just change it to the single line. Then you can save it and commit, and often the commit message there might be that you're, you're fixing a merge conflict. All right, so there's a lot more that you can do with Git and GitHub. Just these pieces we talked about now, we'll be using a lot for the final group projects, and you'll see that, that just those pieces are very, very powerful. Um, but if you want to find out more about this or you want kind of a refresher or some more explanation, there is a really wonderful chapter on this in the R Packages book by Hadley Wickham. So I put the link in for that. And then I wanted to end with this comment. So this is also from XKCD. Um, and I think this resonates with anybody who's used Get before. So this one person's showing and he says, this is Get. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. And she says, cool, how do we use it? No idea, just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project and download a fresh copy. And um, I put this in here just, just as a comfort as you get used to using this. Um, it is very powerful. It, it's pretty straightforward to use a lot of the times with all of this nice interface with RStudio, but there almost always will be cases where every now and then you just kind of like need to burn down a version you have and pull the fresh version from somewhere else. And we'll come across this as we work it in the class. So it's not it's not something that's going to go smoothly 100% of the time, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And that's okay. You can still get a whole lot out of it, even if it feels a little bit frustrating sometimes. <laughs>